America. My name is Jeremy Chapman. And I'm Mark Kucinovich. So Mark, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. We're going to talk about really some of the main security concerns people have around moving to the cloud. And really, you're one of the foremost experts about that. You just released or are going to release a new book, that's right? right? That's right. A book called Rogue Code. And it's, right, it's all about this kind of this space. It's about cybersecurity and the same kinds of infrastructure threats that we see in the cloud. And we'll talk about all the different attack types that people are worried about in terms of moving to the cloud. But before we get started, let's have a look at today's trivia. True or false, with Office 365, all data in transit between Microsoft and Office 365 users is encrypted. All right, so stay tuned for the answer at the end of the show. So Mark, when you think about cloud security, there are really three main vectors that we have, right? That's right. So let's go through, though, our top five threats. We'll, take, we'll assign a threat level to each one of them. Sounds good. And as you, the expert, you can tell us how threatening they are. So number five. Malicious insiders. This is the one that's uh, extremely difficult to defend against. Once some uh, insider gets in, they're a trusted part of the infrastructure. Yeah, it's hard to stop them from doing things that they might not necessarily be able to do. So right. there's a few different mitigations for this kinds of threat that we uh, use inside of Ma Microsoft, both for Azure and Office. One of them is just to do background checks, so you're not pulling random people off the street, and it's one of the common controls for many of the certifications. Another one is. Even if they're in the inside, don't trust them with everything. Trust them only with enough access that they need for to perform a particular job. And so we've got just-in-time access systems that we use throughout Microsoft Cloud Services, where the only way somebody's given permission to touch production systems is if there's a legitimate reason that's been authorized by somebody other than them. And then they're given only the accesses they need to actually go and perform that work. And then the access is revoked immediately after they're done. And this is the difference between on-premises, right? Because a lot of cases on-premises, you might have somebody withstanding permissions, and it's not really operating under lease privileges in all cases. Granted, not all data centers are the same, so some are operating under lease privileges, but in the case of some of the more media intensive focuses that we've had lately, there were standing permissions involved there, right? Yeah, but it's, it's difficult to keep track and to follow a process like this. There is more burden on the workflow, but it's worth it if you care about security. So we give that one, in terms of our threat index, we're going to see, we almost need a drum roll for that. But our low threat index, because we don't have any standing permissions, all of it's just in time, temporary access. You can't go out and start copying off terabytes of data or thousands of documents, you know, in, in some of the classic senses in terms of insider threats. All right, so number four, one of the things that we hear quite a bit is data breach. And I've got this in two parts. Now, the first one's around media breach. Why don't you talk to that for a second? Yeah, so this is physical security. This is somebody can take a disk and walk out of out with it and maybe leak that data to someplace else or go in and try to find some particular customer's physical disk inside of a data center. This one's kind of interesting because uh, we've got a very different physical security footprint than most on-premises environments. You know, a BitLocker, for example, aimed at those client devices that walk around in the wild outside of your control. But when we've got servers and data centers in, in Microsoft, the whole environment's completely under control from the gates that are required for somebody to pass through to even get onto the grounds of the data center. We've got armed guards at, at those gates actually to stop somebody from trying to force their way in. You get into the lobby and you've got to have them prove that you've got authorization to go into the data center uh, facility where the servers are actually located. You're granted access then only under the legitimate reason to get in. And then there's biometric devices that, op that verify your identity as you go into a particular server room to actually be sitting there among the servers. So, and then there's a full auditing and control system around the removal of disks from the data center. All disks are either destroyed or sanitized on their way out. So the risk of something leaving, we try to mitigate in all these different ways. Right, so when you think about it too, from a media perspective, here's one server in a data center where I have maybe one or two racks or it's, you know, it's in the bottom floor of my building. It might be easy to target one of these disks. But when you move to a larger data center like the ones that we have, say, in Illinois, where this is only one row of servers, but just imagine, you have then multiple floors, multiple rows of servers. It's going to be almost impossible to somebody to, for somebody to target that one hard drive that contained those files. So this 
really isn't much of a threat, right? That's right. I don't consider it a very big threat in our environment. The other one that's a bit more of a, of a common threat in terms of um, attacks, man in the middle, somebody who's really being able to sniff network connections either between data centers or from data center to endpoint, right? Nobody would ever do that, would they? No. <laughs> so, so, yeah, of course, explain. we know of cases that have uh, made the news in the last year where there are people that are wanting to sniff traffic across links, sometimes even working with the link providers to get access to that traffic. Microsoft's taken a very hard line stance against this and trying to protect customer data that, as it flows across links that are not under our control. We encrypt any customer data that we're moving on your behalf across those links so that somebody that's sitting there in the middle can't have access to them. Right, so encryption between the data centers and encryption by default on everything from the data center to the actual endpoint. Everything is, is SSL encrypted. Everything, every bit of traffic going from, say, Exchange Online or SharePoint going to that endpoint is going to be encrypted. So this, again, from a threat perspective, is relatively low. Let's have a look at what our needle tells us. It's just slightly about the same or maybe a little bit lower than the last one, but very low in terms of data breach. Let's have a look at our number three commonly heard cloud threat, data loss. Well, in this one, there's a few different ways you can lose data. One is us inadvertently deleting the data. One is that you delete the data. You delete your subscription, for example, and say, oh, crap, I, I didn't mean to do that. And the third one, is, of course, is Mother Nature coming and deleting the data by taking out a data center region with a hurricane or a flood. And we provide tools and mechanisms to, for each one of these to be mitigated. For example, the accidental subscription deletion. We've got tombstoning on your subscription. So when you delete something, your data accounts are actually preserved for up to 90 days. If you need that data back, you can gain access back to the data. You're not charged for that unless you actually come back and need the data. We right. also have asynchronous replication of storage accounts in Azure. We've got Office 365 emails that are being synchronously replicated across different regions to mitigate against regional problems. And so there's a, a, we also have snapshotting technology. So you can take back point in time backups of your, for example, Azure storage. So that and you can I go back to I would to say we even go to a, a whole other level with Office 365 in the sense that we're copying the data at least four times geo-redundantly. Even if you're an admin in the account and you're deleting user accounts, you've got a recycle bin basically at every pass that you're doing. Even in, a, in SharePoint, if you start deleting site contents, there's a recycle bin. Even as an end user himself, all of these things have recycle bins, second level, uh, you know, things that they'd have to do to delete even when they go to try to delete something. It's really difficult to actually permanently delete those files. Yeah, and actually that was a good point you touched on, which is uh, bit rot on systems or servers, disks failing within a region. Even there we have, make sure we have at least three copies of the data in every region that your data is stored in. And we're constantly scrubbing that data to get rid of bit rot errors, which we do see show up. If you run storage at scale, you're going to see bit flips on storage sectors and particular sectors get lost. And so we're going to constantly have automated systems that are scrubbing and refreshing data. Right, so this one has layers of safety nets upon safety nets upon safety nets yeah. in terms of data loss. So we consider this, this threat also to be relatively low, probably even lower than the last one in terms of man in the middle and those types of things. This is a very, very low threat for us, especially in Office 365 and also in, in Azure, right? So number two, this is where the threats get real, I think. This is where we actually talk about things that might actually happen. Due diligence. So here's one of the things, when you think about Office 365, if I want to share a file that's, say, 100 megs or gigabyte in size, and I don't have that capability in mail today, I might go and sign up for a consumer service to share that file. And that consumer service is something that IT doesn't necessarily know about. So you have this concept of BYOIT, or BOIT, yeah. <laughs> that, you've like coined, that. that you've coined, Mark. Try to spread that. Yes, exactly. So what is shadow IT, Mark? So shadow IT is you've got a central IT department, but you've got business units that are seeing the agility of the cloud and circumventing IT processes to go and create services and use cloud storage. IT pros, the IT central IT is not aware of this is going on. You've got these business units that aren't familiar with the best ways to handle credentials for those services or to make sure that they're handling the data properly. And so this poses a risk to the company. If IT is not seeing it and controlling that traffic and providing the right permissions around where data is kept and access and how it's stored, authentication, all of those things that would be part of an Office 365 or an Azure service, then you're exposing yourself from a threat perspective. This one, I would say, is right up there, close to the red line, in the red line, in yeah. terms of threat level. All right, so beyond this one, though, I think this is probably the, one of the top threats that we're hearing about constantly. Number one. Account hijacking. What happens if my credentials are compromised? Yep, if your credentials are compromised, of course, somebody's got access to your data with the same authentic authorization that you've got access. 
So they pose as you, and they can go delete your data. They can steal your data. They can also use your compute resources to perform malicious activity, like create botnets and spam people. Right, and we think about Office 365, this is the most important accounts to protect are the global admin accounts. So we've got role-based access controls built right into the model in terms of having different rings of administrators with different permission levels within that account and within that tenant. That means from an, from an access perspective, with any of these administrators that have, say, global account level especially, you're going to want to protect those using multi-factor authentication to make sure that it's not easy to lose your credentials because you have to have something that you know and something on you in order to get into that service. And one of the things that's important, I think, from a mobile phone perspective, if you're logging with that, you want to make sure that even you're using something else than even the mobile phone if you really want to protect that account because you can log into the service and get something like phone factor uh, messages right on that same device. That's right. This one from a risk perspective is high. So this one is the one that you would want to protect against the most. So I guess in sum, you can look at us as the trusted partner for managing your infrastructure underneath your cloud services, your SaaS services, even your IaaS and PaaS services in the cloud. That doesn't absolve you of responsibilities, of course, to make sure that you're doing your end for the way that your users and your administrators are managing and accessing that data. Right, so these are just five of the common concerns that we hear, but when we think about it, the way that we've architected the service end to end, we've got our three attack vectors of outsider, or insider, or an end user, but we also architect the services in a different way now, right? Yep, this is, uh, you know, in the past, we've seen the shift in uh, cybersecurity and the way that cybersecurity is approached from a perimeter defense. Put up the big walls, invest a lot of money there. Don't really worry about what happens when somebody gets over the wall. We've moved to a new world where we see breaches all the time, even from, very, from companies that have invested a tremendous amount in perimeter defense. And so now we know we've got to move to a, an assumed breach model, which is what we operate with in all of Microsoft Cloud Services. What assume breach means is that if you know that attackers are going to be able to get no matter how much you make those walls, how strong you make those walls. So assume that. Make sure that you're monitoring and you're isolating, containerizing, segregating your network assets so that once somebody gets in, they're isolated as much as possible, and you've got audit controls, and you're monitoring those audit controls to see if somebody's performing, somebody's got in, and they're performing uh, some activity that is anomalous and shows that you have been breached. Finally, customer controls. SDL is a key part of what Microsoft's actually brought to the industry, not just our own software, for making sure that we threat model every one of our services, that we're using uh, security software engineering tools like uh, DEP and ASLR in our compilers to make sure that we're as secure as we can be. And from an Office 365 standpoint, this is where we really differentiate in terms of being able to provide things like rules and email that will apply rights management services to say, for example, a, a mail that's going out of the server. When we detect that it's a patent application or that it's you know, a tax form, those types of things, we can do that proactively. We can do things like e-discovery, a lot of controls that are built in beyond the rule set, the policy management set that we have, and also, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of just the rings of different administrator account levels as part of that service that we architect directly in there. So this is just a brief tour of the five most commonly heard threats we hear from the Office 365 side. I know there are more that you're probably wondering about, but before we wrap up, let's have a look at today's trivia. True or false? With Office 365, all data in transit between Microsoft and Office 365 users is encrypted. All right, so all, tra all, all traffic is encrypted. We just said that yep. a few minutes ago yep. on the show. Everybody knows that's it's true. It's not trivia now. anymore. It's not trivia anymore. Exactly. So one of the important things I think to, to take from this session is we try to make sure that from an Office 365 and a Microsoft Cloud perspective that we are at least as secure as your on-premises infrastructure, if not more, right? That's right, and I think when we talk to most customers and we tell them what we're doing and the kind of controls that we've got, the certifications that we have that prove that we are following through with a lot of these things that we've talked about, they say, you know what, you, you actually are probably more secure than we are. So of course, all of this information more can be found. Where do you blog these days, Mark? Actually, I haven't been blogging much. But you haven't been blogging, <laughs> but you have your own website, yeah, and right. you're, you're also got, on Twitter. That's right, I'm on Twitter, I, uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Right, and I encourage everybody to look at the Office 365 Trust Center at trust.office365.com and also the Office blog at blogs.office.com and you can follow the Garage series at Office Garage on Twitter. Thank you everybody for watching and goodbye for now.